Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are a fan of true, disturbing, or unsettling stories, you've found the right channel. And also, by leaving a subscribe, like, share, or comment really does help me out. And it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. So, sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled The Rising Phoenix. Before I start reading, thank each and every last one of you that sent me birthday wishes. I really do appreciate it. This is my last trip around the sun in my 30s. Yay for me, more gray hair. <laughs> anyway, I decided I would like to share my favorite genre, which is fictional horror because I do it so well, and I've voiced a lot of creatures, crazy people, blah, 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 blah. That's why I love it so much. And, of course, it's where my roots started. So, if fictional stories are not your thing, this video will not be for you. With that being said, for everyone else, let's get to it. Right after this intro, an ad will be played. I'll read the first story, an ad will be played. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. And because these stories are horror, behind the rain, there will be a soft horror music playing. Just soft enough that it shouldn't bother you. Disclaimer, some of these stories might actually contain material not suitable for all, so listening discretion is advised. All right, settle in, because we're diving into the hair-raising saga of the Whispering Woods. Picture this, a quaint hamlet, surrounded by these towering ancient trees like nature's own centennials. Now, these woods, they got a reputation. People say their whispers can make even the bravest of souls do a double take. Rule number one, after sunset, stick to the path. Trust me, you do not want to go off-roading in these woods after dark. Things get lively, and I mean that in the spookiest way possible. Rule number two, avoid eye contact with those spectral figures. They've got this gaze that's like a sticky trap. They lock eyes, and you might as well write your own ghost story. Rule number three. Pretend you're the world's best earmuff model when you hear those distant cries. They're like sirens, calling you deeper into the heart of the creepy. Rule number four. Don't even think about leaving that lantern behind. It's like your own little force field against the nastiest that lurk. Rule number five, when you leave, seal those lips. Speaking of what you've seen, it's like rolling out the red carpet for horrors to stroll right back into your world. Rule number six, once you cross the threshold, don't even think about turning back. The path starts playing tricks on you leading you to spots where no human hand has dared to reach. Remember, these rules aren't just quaint stories told to keep you up at night. They're a pact, an unspoken agreement between the living and these, well, let's just call them lively whispering woods. Disobey, and, well, Let's just say the woods have a way of making sure you won't be bragging about it. And then there's the Man-Man, a character who's equal parts, eerie and oddly amusing. He's ventured where few dared to tread and lived to tell the tale. His stories, like the woods themselves, are a mystery to be unraveled. If You've got the guts for it.
Tuesday night, Darcy and I were out scouting Halloween events in the country to take our girlfriends to on the weekend. There are several haunted houses in town, but everyone goes to those, and we wanted to take them somewhere different, interesting, something they'd remember forever. I think we achieved that goal, just not the way I expected. I was driving because I own and maintain the car. Before we left, I went through the usual steps, like telling Darcy to put on his damn seatbelt and recording our starting mileage, which was 36,177, which Darcy said was a good sign. He also informed me he's never gone past town limits before. Darcy's my roommate, and a talk like that is why I reminded him about the seatbelt whenever he's in the car with me. Darcy was checking I don't know what as soon as we got on the road. He kept shouting out the names of promising events, and every single time I had to tell him to enter it on the GPS. Most of the locations were too far away. He found a haunted hayride in Ottawa, Canada. My car's in good shape, but gas doesn't grow on trees. In Canada? <laughs> My car doesn't have the snow tires. Look, I researched before we left. There are like a dozen farms within an hour's drive from the town limit. Finding some kind of crazy Halloween event should have been a simple two, maybe three hour road trip at the most. Around 4.30 p.m., I was ready to call it quits. We'd been on the road since two, and the only thing close to a scary event was Duncan Dive, where you had to jump off a diving board and pick up an apple from the bottom of some guy's pool with your teeth. Did I mention the event was for women only? We were on a Kirkston side road when we passed a sign that said we were on a side road to 11. Darcy was the one who noticed it and asked me where we'd made the turn. Thing was, we hadn't made a turn and GPS said we were still on Kirkston. Maybe someone switched signs around for an extra bit of a scare. He offered. I nodded and gently pushed the gas pedal a little further down. Something felt off about the road, not matching the GPS. I'd never heard of a side road to 11, and we hadn't made a turn off Kirkston since leaving the Duncan Dive place. Not more than a minute later, Darcy told me to pull over at an upcoming sign. It was a huge wooden roadside sign. Some of it looked hand-painted, despite churning up a cloud of dust. I managed to pull over and stop the car as requested. The sign promised a scary cornfield maze, a mare three miles down the first road on our right. Further, it listed a concession stand for drinks, snacks, and light meals. Oh yeah, and free parking. Plus the maze could be completed in 20 to 30 minutes, so it was, as the sign said, ideal for young children and people in a hurry. It's worth a look, Darcy said. I glanced at the dashboard. It's already five, the sun sets in an hour. Are you sure? Darcy was sure. We'll be there in three minutes. We don't have to go through the maze. Maybe we can reserve a spot for Friday night if it looks good. Let's just go. Bro, cornfields feature big in horror movies. Uh, so I repeat, are you sure? He rolled the window up part way and held up his phone. It was displaying the current time as 5.04. Three minutes. If we aren't there in three minutes, we turn around to go home. Deal? I threw the car into gear and got back on the road. Darcy chuckled, put his phone on the seat divider, and rolled down his window again. We turned right at the first crossroad, and sure enough, 
I could see a turn here for the maze sign a short distance down the road with an arrow pointing to the left. I drove. Darcy picked up his phone. It should have been the easiest drive of the day, but my gut was telling me something was out of place. I wanted to go at top speed, but didn't want to punch the gas. The sign to turn was so close, but we didn't get any closer to the sign. We were doing 40 miles an hour and weren't going anywhere. I took the risk and punched the gas. We went to 50, to 60, to 75 miles per hour and still managed not to get any closer to our destination. The sun had dropped. It was already dusk. We had been driving forever and hadn't moved an inch. What time is it? I screamed as I hit the brakes. The car, which I swear hadn't moved at all, kicked up another cloud of dust and sat, purring, in the middle of the dirt road. Calm down, bro. It's like 5.06. What's your issue? He waved his phone in front of me. It was showing the current time as 5.06. Sweat was running down the left side of my forehead. I swiped at it with my left hand and blinked twice before looking out at the windshield. We were parked under overhead lights in an otherwise empty parking lot. Except for the lights, it was already dark. We were facing a swath of corn stalks with flashing enter here signs at the side of a pathway, separating the stalks into two sections. Darcy was already out of his seatbelt and about to open the door. I realized I was holding my breath, so I exhaled as calmly as possible. How the hell did we get here? He turned to stare at me as his door opened. I get it, Paz. You didn't want to check this out. Stay put. I'll do it myself. Movement on the other side of the door caught my attention. The door opened fully, and as Darcy climbed out, the hottest girl I have ever seen held the door open for him. She wasted no time taking his arm and leading him to the pathway and into the cornfield. By the time I got out of the car, I couldn't see either of them. I started jogging along the pathway. They couldn't be that far ahead of me, but with the corn stalks on both sides, it was hard to see too far, and I don't know why, but I got the unsettling feeling the stalks were getting closer to me as I continued. A sharp pain on the top of my head made me see stars. Before my vision cleared, several knives jabbed into my shoulders, arms, and back. The sound of bullets hitting the ground around me drowned out my screams. Who the hell's trying to kill me and why? None of this made any sense until I saw hail the size of golf balls falling all around me. Not knives, not bullets. A hailstorm had appeared out of nowhere. I unlocked the car with my fob, then held my hands over my head for whatever cover they could provide when I ran back to the car for protection. I figured Darcy would make his way back to the car as well. No such luck. Wherever the hot girl took him, I hoped it was keeping them out of danger because I could begin to plan my next move. The hell stopped and was replaced by the sound of a million cicadas. My heart rate had increased and it was loud enough to compete with the cicadas for most annoying noise of the night. There was no way I would hear Darcy over all that, so no point yelling for him to answer me. Figuring he was somewhere within the maze, I texted him to do something so I could find him. Whatever it was, I told him to make it obvious and to wait until I showed up. A short text came back. The light. Light? What light? I sat in the car because 
Well, because I didn't know what to do next. The cicadas were getting louder. My windows were closed, and the bug symphony was starting to hurt my ears. I could feel my muscles tensing as if my body was ready for fight or flight. Not a good sign. And I didn't see any. Then, I saw it. An obscenely bright light from within the maze. I closed my eyes and could still see the light. And the bugs got louder. I stuck my phone into my jacket pocket and slammed my hands over my ears. Eyes closed, ears covered, missing one passenger. The day showed signs of not ending well. Can't lie, I almost shit myself when someone knocked loudly on my side window. Although my heart was still pounding, I couldn't hear the cicadas anymore, even with my hands off of my ears. And I didn't see the light, so I slowly opened my eyes. First, the left, then the right. The second hottest girl I have ever seen had opened my car door. She smiled, put her hand on my arm and said, Hi, I'm Poppy. You should go home. Poppy wasn't wrong, but I wasn't about to leave without Darcy. I put my left foot on the ground to show I was getting out of the car. She moved slightly, but didn't let go of my arm. As I stood, I was able to look directly into her eyes. They reminded me of goat eyes. I've never raised goats, but I've seen enough horror movies to know goat eyes when I see them. The bright light shone into the sky from the same spot as before. It was off before I could shield my eyes with my hands. Poppy's hand on my arm was starting to bother me, like I was allergic to her or something. It was pretty disturbing since I was wearing a jacket and no matter what was on her hand, it shouldn't be affecting my skin. You should go home, she repeated, still smiling. Okay, Poppy, I'll leave as soon as I get Darcy. No, go home. Celine will make sure he calls. A scream jarred me so badly I shook. It was a deeper toned voice, not high pitched. It sounded like Darcy. Poppy's hand was uncomfortably warm, approaching hot. There was no way her hand should have felt that hot. The bright light appeared again and disappeared almost immediately. Another scream. That time, I was sure it came from the same area as the light. Poppy pushed down heavily on my arm, which caused me to lean forward slightly. She brought her beautiful face with goat eyes so close to my face I could have kissed her on the cheek without moving. Go home. She whispered into my ear. Problem was, I felt no air, no breath from her. She whispered without speaking out loud. I pushed her hand off of my arm and ran towards the pathway to get to the light. The pattern of bright light followed by a scream continued. By the fifth scream, I forced my way through the corn stalks for a few feet instead of sticking to the pathway. That was a mistake. The hottest girl, who I guess was Celine, was standing to my left, hands held in a prayer position, her face glowing like she was an angel. She looked happier than a kid getting a new car for Christmas, but far from calm. I think maybe it was an expression of joy. Her gaze was locked onto the events ahead of her. As much as she looked like she was watching the greatest thing on earth, I had to fight the sense of dread to turn my head in the same direction. The green human face stared at me with roughly three feet above ground. The face extended from and was supported by a few corn stalks. There was no body, no legs, no arms. It was just a face. A face that was consuming Darcy. Darcy's head, 
right hand and part of his torso were sticking out of the green face's mouth. As much as I wanted to pull Darcy out, I froze in place and tried to figure out how his arm was bent, so only his hand was visible. I don't think Darcy knew I was there. He never turned to look at me. The way he extended from the green face was almost comical until the bright light shined again for half a second. The green mouth widened slightly and drew Darcy in up to his neck. So only his head was visible. Darcy gave one last desperate scream. I wanted to pull Darcy out of May's face. I wanted to see if he was all right and laugh with him all the way to the car. I wanted to get out of there and never speak of this again. Instead, my body staunchly refused to move, even when May's face stared at me and smiled. I'm glad May's face didn't speak. I don't know how I would have reacted. His smile alone forced me to sit on my haunches, shaking, hugging myself, and gasping. Once I was seated, the bright light blipped one last time and Darcy disappeared. I wanted nothing more than to get the hell out of there, but I sat, rocking back and forth, crying like I was the upcoming victim in a dumbass horror movie. Out of nowhere, Poppy grabbed my arm again and pulled me to my feet. I was sure she was going to push me into May's face. Instead, she pushed me through the stalks, toward the path to get out of the cornfield. She spoke one last time. One sacrifice per moon. One. So go home. No one will believe you. My arm hurt really badly. So badly, I stopped staring at her and glanced at her hand on my arm. My jacket sleeve wasn't engulfed in flames, but smoke was coming from my arm. I'm not proud to admit what I did next, but it's the truth and I gotta get it out. Instead of fighting Poppy, instead of fighting May's face, instead of taking pictures or doing anything heroic, I shook her hand off of my arm and ran. When I almost got to the car, I tripped over some corn stalks that I hadn't managed to kick away while running, without thinking, because thinking was almost impossible for me at that point. I took another step and ended up on the hood of the car, entangled in the stalks. I don't remember any more of that night, not the drive home, not getting into the house, not getting into bed. Wednesday morning, Darcy wasn't in the house. I told myself he'd got an early ride to work or gone to his girlfriend's after we got home. But when I got out of the shower and saw Poppy's handprints on my arm, I knew. I knew it before I saw corn stalks stuck in the wipers and before I checked the car's mileage. 600 miles more then we started the drive Tuesday afternoon. Still, I didn't want to acknowledge it. I went into work alone, and when Darcy wasn't there, I assured myself he'd gone to his girlfriend's. His girlfriend texted me as soon as I got home Wednesday. Darcy hadn't contacted her all day. Was he okay? I said we were on different shifts this week. Thursday morning, I hadn't seen or heard from Darcy. Couldn't even finish my coffee, so I drowned half a bottle of Pepto to calm down my stomach. It didn't work. Mid-afternoon, my shift leader called me over. You look like hell, he said quietly. Um, I'm, I'm fine, thanks. <laughs> no, you aren't. You're shaking, sweating. And if I didn't know better, I'd say your skin is gray. You don't smell of alcohol, and I don't see any signs of other intoxicants. You're not well. Get out of here, dude. See a doctor. 
if you don't feel better tomorrow. Just text me and let me know. He wasn't wrong. I recoiled every time Darcy's girlfriend texted, even though I'd stopped replying on Wednesday. I couldn't eat, chat, or focus on my work. A police car pulled into the parking lot as I was leaving. A very common occurrence. When they're taking a break, they often come to the coffee shop in our building. For the first time ever, I scrunched down as low as possible, hoping the cop didn't see me behind the steering wheel. So, here I am, sitting in the corner of my bedroom, rocking back and forth and questioning all of my life's decisions. Darcy's gone. He's never coming back. And it won't take long for police to suspect me. His face is waiting placidly until next month for his next meal. And I'm the obvious choice. I don't know what to do about any of this, so after this uploads, I'm going back to bed. These next three stories are from an author that I used to narrate all the time over on Phoenix Fire Narrations, my horror channel. So, with that being said, listening discretion is severely advised, as this author loves the dark, dark side of horror stories. With that being said, let's jump right on in. The House That Madness Built, written by Chronic Nightmare. Mother knows best. How's it going in there, love? Ned shouted to his wife from behind the bathroom door. la di da ti doo da Violet stopped bathing the baby. Everything's fine, honey bun. Just giving Lucy a bath. I'm going to watch the footy with Dylan. Give me a shout if you need anything. Will do. Violet plunged Lucy's head back under the boiling hot water. Lucy wasn't squirming anymore. She was limp in Violet's hands, floating, her skin red raw like a cooked lobster. Probably just a succulent as one, too. Though she certainly didn't have any plans to eat her daughter. It was really just a fun thought is all. Shall we go downstairs and see Daddy? Violet lifted her daughter from the steaming tub, her tiny body flopping about in her arms. Buddy da dee do da day. It made me do it. She brought Lucy down to the living room where Ned and their lifeless blue lipped son, Dylan, were set on the sofa watching Manchester United take on their rivals, Manchester City, on the TV. Well, that's Lacey, all cleaned up and ready for her nap, Violet said, as she walked into the living room carrying her bright, red, and very dead daughter. How's the match going? Absolutely terrible. There's two fucking offsides the referee has failed to notice now. Fucking wanker. Ned's face was almost as red with anger as Lacey's burnt skin. Good thing Dylan was here to calm me down. Ain't that right, boy? Yes, Daddy. Ned moved his son's blue lips as he spoke for him in a squeaky tone. Oh, it's always good to see my two favorite boys getting along, Violet said as she violently rocked Lacey in her arms. Now, how about you take your daughter for a bit while I go and put dinner on? It wants my children. For dinner, Violet had something very special planned. Ned's favorite. She squatted down and shat a huge turd onto the floor. More than enough for all of them. Thank fuck for all that fiber. She scooped up the heavily smelling shit with her bare hands, then dolloped a 
healthy portion onto their plate. Dinner's ready, she shouted. Ned came in, carrying Lacey in one arm and dragging Dylan behind him like an old sack, his head bumping onto the side of the door with a sickening crack as he did so. Oh, yeah, that smells lovely, Ned said as he chucked Lacey onto the table, then propped Dylan up before sitting down himself. Violet sat down in front of her plate. For a brief moment, something clicked in her head, a realization, if you will, but it was soon gone just as quickly as it came. Well, what are you waiting for? Tuck in, Violet said before shoving a handful of fecal matter into her gob. I could feel the evil in that house. Detective Luby, Scotland Yard. No Smoking, written by Chronic Nightmares. Mrs. Ligby stood before the assembly with a stern look painted on her face, a look the kids knew all too well. It has come to my attention that some of you have been using the school toilets for smoking. She eyed all of the kids in front of her, and I'm here to tell you that it is going to stop right now. <laughs> yeah, right, Joe whispered to Terry next to him. They both chuckled. Quiet, Mrs. Ligby shouted. She then continued on. Measures are now in place to prevent such disgusting habits from being indulged on school premises. Her gaze fell on Joe and Terry. The next student who decides to light up in my toilet will find themselves in for a nice little surprise. Once assembly was over, there was many questions, especially from Joe and Terry, who both enjoyed a nice sneaky cigarette in the toilet. What do you think she was on about? Terry asked. I don't have a fucking clue, Joe replied, his face turning to a grin. <laughs> Shall we find out? They both made their way to the toilet, making sure that no teachers were watching as they did so. The toilets reeked of piss, but that didn't matter. All that mattered was that sweet nicotine craving. They both picked a cubicle next door to each other, then sat down on the toilet before locking the doors. Terry lit up first as a plume of smoke rose above the cubicle. Can you pass me the lighter? Joe said. He passed the lighter under the cubicle. Yeah, looks like Miss Ligby is full of shit. <laughs> Joey placed a cigarette between his lips, then lit it. Bitch ain't gonna do shit now. Terry didn't reply. You gonna take your lighter back or what? He held the lighter under the cubicle for a moment longer. Fine, I'll keep it then. He put the lighter into his pocket and took another drag of his cigarette. Why are you ignoring me? Joe knocked on the cubicle wall. Another knock came in reply. What are you doing? Joe peeked under the cubicle. You are being fucking wit. He couldn't see Terry's feet. And when he'd been down even more, he could only see an empty stall. Terry? He called out nervously. Then something else caught his eye as he peered further in. Red smears on the walls that were still wet. Joe discarded the rest of his cigarette into the toilet bowl and tried to open the cubicle door. It was stuck. Then the feeling hit, that sense of being watched. He hesitantly looked up. Watching him from the opening at the top of the cubicle was a featureless face sitting on the end of an elongated neck that reached all the way through. Then it held Terry mangled head up for Joe to see, 
the cigarette was still between his twitching lips. It threw the head onto Joe's lap. Terry's disembodied head then turned to face Joe. No smoking! The Bridge, written by Chronic Nightmares. When the bridge first appeared, it certainly raised a few eyebrows around town. Not only was it odd, seemingly having appeared overnight, with nobody having a clue who had built it or why. The bridge was hunched, curving steeply over the river, almost cartoonishly, so to speak. It was more like a bridge from a fairy tale than one that resembled reality. It was the talk of the town, and everyone and their mother was talking about it. The mayor even called up an emergency town hall meeting. Needless to say, the bridge was causing quite the stir. And, as the days turned into weeks, the bridge remained, and stories about those who crossed it were plentiful and unsettling. The first was little Bobby Crisco, who had rode his bike across the bridge, then returned home to his mother on foot, holding a bloody stump where his left hand used to be. He never said what happened. He stayed silent. They never could get him to talk. After the brutal maiming of Bobby, access to the bridge was forbidden. A small unit of police officers were given the task of guarding it until a thorough investigation could be launched. Whether it was out of boredom, curiosity, or stupidity, I don't know. All I know is that two officers crossed the bridge and only one of them made it back, and not all in one piece either. His eyes had been removed as two had his entire right arm, which looked to have been torn. And just like Bobby, the officer remained a mute right up until he threw himself from a hospital window, plunging to his death in silence. A small group of people, myself included, volunteered to investigate, armed with whatever we had available. We gathered in front of the bridge, Everyone remained silent, all staring at the bridge, which seemed much more intimidating up close. I was the first to move forward, inching myself closer with tiny steps as the others followed behind. We were halfway across the bridge before we realized that the way we came had vanished. Behind us was just a black void of nothing. It was the same ahead of us, too. We were trapped between two dark voids, sandwiching us in the middle of the bridge. A little, hairy, troll-like creature emerged from the void. It looked no bigger than a three-foot tall and bore a horrible, razor-tooth grin. Time to pay the troll. The creature's grin widened all the way up to its bushy eyebrows. If you ever want to get off of this bridge, that is. I'll spare you the details. All I will say is that the price for freedom was steep, yet far more favorable than being trapped on that bridge. That creature took my voice and three fingers from my left hand. I got lucky. And I'll tell you one thing. I'm never going near that bridge again. The toll is too steep and far too painful. And now, dear listeners, for our final story also comes from a good friend of mine, and I've narrated a lot of his work over on my other channel. This one I think you will like. Here we go. The Looney Bin, written by Horgasm. Will you please stop calling it that? Kim barked in a hushed tone at her husband as the couple trailed shortly behind the head doctor of the institution. Well, that's what it is. 
Nick was uncomfortable there. Every so often, a shriek or a deranged howl would erupt through one of the locked cell doors on either side. They sounded inhuman, making him shudder at the thought of his son being amongst them. More like a prison than a hospital. Right this way, please. Dr. Klecks motioned for the couple to follow him into his office. The white, bare interiors of the halls, cramped administrative offices and common rooms were replaced by an immediate sense of reassuring coziness as they stepped inside and were enveloped by an all-wooden room with furnishings. Antique bookcases filled with various psychological and philosophical texts, as well as novels and biographies, were lined floor to ceiling, covering three of the four walls, accentuating the smell. Meticulously trimmed bonsai trees centered behind the doctor on the quiche little chest of drawers below the window as he sat with his arms folded neatly atop his shiny mahogany desk. A sharp sliver of summer sunlight shone in overhead and Nick felt somewhat at ease for the first time since they set foot in the old stony building. The air hung intoxicatingly with the aroma of old books and lingering sage incense, reminding him of his grandfather's study. I'd like to assure you, Dr. Klex began, as he thumbed through papers before picking out their son's file and having a good look at it over the rim of his glasses, that this institution prides itself on a sense of deep, rehabilitative calmness. Your son, with some of the issues he's been having, will more than certainly benefit from an extended stay. We have a consistently high turnover rate when it comes to insanity. A small mousy chuckle escaped the old man's thin lips, almost imperceptible under the bushy gray mustache like some benign ventriloquist's trick. He excused his forward attempt at levity with a short cough before continuing. <clears throat> well, insanity is a bit of a bad word for many people, and that's okay. It's one laden with centuries of frightful connotations some more appropriate than others. We get a great many young men struggling with a range of complex psychological and behavioral disorders, many of whom have acted out violently as a result. The couple listened intently, both clearly uncomfortable, but determined to do what was best for their boy. So please, if you have questions, any at all, don't hesitate to ask. Kim had made the arrangement. The conversation she had had over the phone with a nurse had calmed her initial reservations. But actually, being there had revived a deep concern inside her. It was, after all, Lashbrook Psychiatric Hospital, formerly Lashbrook Asylum for the Criminally Insane before the scandals. Uh, doctor, she started as tactfully as she could. Things really are different here now, aren't they? We heard about some of the things that happened to the patients, I mean. She squeezed her husband's hand tighter in hers. Ah, oh, yes. That's usually the first question. Perfectly understandable. Dr. Klex removed his thick frame glasses and rubbed the lenses tentatively with a silk handkerchief. While it was many years ago, I find it a societal imperative that we as a people not allow ourselves to forget such tragedies so easily. I'm glad you brought it up, quite frankly. He slid the glasses back on and the brown legs vanished into his bushy gray hair. What remained of it, around the sides anyway? 
The bald patch on top glistened, catching a blinding sun shimmer, which adorned the pudgy elderly gentleman like a shining halo. Nick thought that if he looked directly at it, he might very well go blind. He caught himself looking anyway, before remembering that it was rude to stare so blatantly at people's bald spots. He glanced around at the floor in embarrassment as Dr. Klecks met his gaze. I haven't been the head of this facility for very long. Most orderlies are relatively new as well. In fact, only a very small number of staff remain from those terrible old days, the majority of whom are nurses, and I assure you that they've all long been cleared of any wrongdoing. Nurses? Nick said abruptly before toning his voice down. But surely when it came to the torture, uh, surely nurses would have been present there, right? Are, uh, are, um, uh, are any of those nurses still employed here? Dr. Klex's face started to turn gray and solemn like an ancient statue, choosing his answer carefully and summoning up tact of his own. As I said, all current staff have been cleared of any criminal wrongdoing. All instances of malpractice of the kind that you mentioned were directly overseen and sanctioned by my predecessor, Dr. Gosh, a man I thankfully never had the misfortune of meeting myself. Any staff present or who assisted in such acts were simply doing their job, as awful as it sounds. Just following orders, huh? The doctor read the outrage rising in Nick's voice, and he attempted to edify his position more clearly. That is what the courts decided, yes. Now, I can well say this institution is very different indeed. They all are, thankfully. For hundreds of years, places like these were simply seen as somewhere to permanently discard society's human refuse. Wretched souls deemed incurable and so left to rot in their own filth and misery, manacled to the floor or to the wall or, on occasion, a bed if they were fortunate enough. And the experiments that were performed, the tortures, as you call them, they were seen as crucial steps in the name of scientific progress. A necessary evil, if you will. Evil is the right word, Kim piped up. In retrospect, I would most certainly agree. The road to hell is often paved with the best intentions. Something my father used to say. He was deployed on the Western Front, a very stoic man and very wise. At least that's how I view him now again, in retrospect. The doctor seemed to lose his train of thought for a moment, staring past the couple into space. Nick cleared his throat, drawing Klex back to the present. Uh, hmm. But my digress. I apologize. Perhaps you'd be able to tell me a little bit more about your son. What is he like at home? Well, I... I, um... Kim began impeded by a choke in her throat. She looked over to her husband, urging him to take the lead. Um, recently, Doctor, in all honesty, it's been a living hell. It's as if he doesn't even have any interest in being part of the real world. At first, he was skipping school, hanging around with a bad crowd. But now, it's... <sighs> It's just too much. Nick felt tears welling up in his own eyes, but he stifled them expertly, pushing it all deep down the way he'd been taught as a boy. Hmm, could you elaborate? 
Clack started to reach for a box of tissues before drawing back his hand after noticing the glare in Nick's eye. I know that these things can be difficult to discuss. No, no, it's all right, doctor. Let's just get this over with. Nick drew in a deep breath, squeezing his partner's hand even tighter than she held his, so tight that Kim had to wiggle free of his grip due to the pain. He's been killing animals, cats, dogs, you name it. We found a pit in the woods behind our house. Kim erupted into bubbling tears, unable to contain her grief any longer. Clex held out the box, and Nick took a few tissues and passed them along, stealthily, holding one balled up in his palm, just in case he also found himself in need of it. Well, that certainly is... disconcerting. Can you tell me when it all began? No, we can't. Nick found himself reminiscing against his will of simpler times before his son began to change, when they were still happy. But that pit, some of them were just bones, from what I could see under the mess of it all. Kim's cries intensified. She excused herself, choosing to wait in the hallway. As the door closed behind her, Nick knew he was on the verge of losing it himself. He turned to Dr. Klex, eyes watering, pleading. Please, doctor, will you help him? We'll do the best we can, Mr. Jones. You have my word on that. With that promise, Nick Jones joined his wife, and they collapsed into each other's weary embrace. Together, they sobbed quietly as they made their way back through the hospital grounds and out into the parking lot. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these stories entitled A Rising Phoenix, meaning I went back to my roots as a horror narrator. Before I go any further, I would like to take this moment and thank the reform members of Back to Ashes. Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Tina Mee, Colt Stone Wolf, Luz Crispin, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norma D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Thank each and every last one of you for continuing to support Back to Ashes. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed these disturbing tales. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourselves a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.